But tonight we're um, stoked to have um, Jay Patton here with us from the Department of Geology. Jay got his undergraduate and master's degree at HSU, and then he got his PhD at Oregon State up in Corvallis. And so he's been teaching here for about a year or so. And so, um, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Jay. Thanks a lot for coming. Thanks to Blondie. Thank you, Jay. I really love this, uh, this difficult uh, genre of communication. And I'd like to thank Blondie also for having us here. And uh, my talk is going to be divided into three 20 minute sections, plus or minus 20 minutes. And uh, so that's my joke. I forgot my joke, so that was my joke. Um, and then we're going to have uh, two 10 minute breaks. And those are the 10 minutes that you'll have to go get more beverages from Blondie's. Because they're letting us come in here. So, anyhow, I'm going to be uh, uh, talking about the Cascadia subduction zone. I'm going to talk about earthquakes, tsunamis, and the last third of the section will be about sea level and how tectonics contributes to sea level in our, in our region. Uh, so, I'm going to be, uh, I've stolen a whole bunch of material, but uh, I'm not really stealing it because I'm referring to the people who have provided it, all right? So these are the people who have done lots of the work that I'm going to be presenting. I've done some of the work, but most of the work, the majority of the work, has been done by uh, my colleagues here. Uh, some local colleagues and some distant colleagues. And um, I posted, I, peas and carrots. So um, uh, I was a stagehand at night. Um, so I posted, I'll be posted, I posted this PowerPoint and some background material on my website, and I posted a link to that website on the Facebook event for this event. And so you should all go to uh, Science on Tap Humboldt has a Facebook page, and then uh, join up, and then you'll hear about, hear about these cool things in the future. Uh, and then also, I uh, post an earthquake report to earthj.com, which is kind of like Earth Day, but it's Earth J. All right, so um, we're going to do some exercise. You know, I, I'm falling asleep because I'm miserably hot, and so we're going to do some exercise to wake us up. I'm going to put this down, I'm going to just yell really loud, okay? <laughs> so I want everyone to get their arms up like this and keep your arms pretty horizontal. And what we're going to do is we're going to model the subduction zone, all right? You guys are going to create your own subduction zone model, and I call this the wrist and finger model of a seduction zone. And so what we're going to do is we're going to put our fingertips on our wrist. Okay, now those that's the, the locked fault of the seduction zone. Just like this Velcro holding your fingers there, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to move our elbows towards each other, and then we're going to let the hand, the hand, the wrist and fingers that are on top flex a little bit. So I'm going to do it and help you. So I move my elbows together, my wrist goes up, and my fingers go down. That's when the fault is locked in between earthquakes. Now, what's going to happen to my fingers when the fault slips? Do they go up or down? They go up. That's right. So, so in between earthquakes, the wrist goes up and the fingers go down. During the earthquake, the fingers go up and the wrist goes down. It's kind of like an inchworm. And so we're going to be talking about where you are. We're going to be talking about are we on the wrist or the finger part of the subduction zone throughout the talk. Okay. So here is the diagram that my colleague Brian Atwater put together in 2005. And this shows exactly what you just did. So you guys are experts now in subduction zone mechanics. So when the fault is locked, this area, the fingers part of the seduction zone goes down. This part of the seduction zone, this is the wrist part, and this goes up. The inner seismic part of the, of the earthquake cycle in between earthquakes. During the earthquake, the co-seismic part of the seduction zone earthquake cycle, the opposite happens. The fingers go up and the wrist goes down. And when the fingers go up, obviously they're not fingers, it's the seduction zone, it pushes this water column up and then that water column is elevated, and what goes up must come down, and, it, and then that water oscillates up and down, and it sends waves out circularly. And so it's called, a tsunami is also known as a, a gravitational oscillation. All right? So we're going to talk about earthquakes and tsunamis, and then later about um, sea level. So here's a great... Um, 
photo that my uh, friend Kenji Satake took, you can't really see, um, but maybe uh, when you download this PowerPoint on your own, you'll be able to see it a little bit better. Um, this is, uh, he took this photo over Japan following the March 11, 2011 subduction zone earthquake. And these areas here, there are three large areas here that have um, been flooded. Now before the earthquake, these areas were above high tide. And after the earthquake, now they're being inundated by seawater. So are we on the finger or the wrist part of the subduction zone? We're on the wrist, we go down, so we get co-seismic substance. And I love this photo because it kind of looks like the Eel River Basin, South and our South Bay and Arcata Bay. So it kind of looks like what it might look like here when we have a Cascadia subduction zone earthquake. And so here's a little animation, oh, and it's working, that my colleagues at Caltech put together. And look at the island. So as the fault is locked, the island is going down. And then the earthquake's going to happen, it's going to slip, it puts the, earth, the, the island up, and so where is the island, on the finger or the wrist? Finger. On the finger. So we've seen an example of where you are if you're on the wrist, an example of where you are on the finger. And so here is a map of the Cascadia subduction zone, which is a major plate boundary in between the Juan de Fuca Explorer and Gorda Place, which are subducting underneath the North America plate. This is the North America plate. And this is a cross section from A to A prime showing you the, the wrist and the finger part of the Cascadia subduction zone. So we're going to be uh, trying to evaluate and figure out where we are. Are we on the finger or the wrist? Here is a wonderful diagram that Bob McPherson from the Humboldt State Department of Geology put together oh, decades ago, and then later was colorized. And this is another view. We're sort of like um, on, in Idaho, uh, you know, halfway to the moon, looking down, and we could see the Gorda Plate and the Juan de Fuca Plate are subducting beneath the North America Plate. And here we are in Humboldt Bay. This also shows the San Andreas Fault and the Mendocino Fault, which are strike-slip faults going side by side. And this also shows that the North America Plate is sliced up into other faults. And some of those faults run through our region that caused lots of the local topography here. So we have, uh, this is the Little Salmon Fault, which creates Humboldt Hill behind uh, College of the Redwoods. And this is the Mad River and Trinidad Fault Zones. So just a little background. Um, so in 1944 and 1946 in Japan, there were a pair of uh, peas and carrots, peas and carrots. There were a pair, there was a pair, there was a pair, there's a pair of subduction zone earthquakes in southern Japan. All right. And these two earthquakes woke Japan up. Uh, well, they were already awake, but it inspired them to start spending millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars to study earthquakes. And they, Japan is now the most, site, most instrumented, geologically instrumented nation state in the world. And, uh, and this is some data that uh, inspired that. So, so uh, and the vertical axis is either co-seismic subsidence in millimeters or inner seismic uplift in millimeters per year. And so here I've highlighted in yellow the co-seismic measurement. So here um, in the horizontal axis, it's distance from the, the fault tip. So the fault tip is right at the edge of the plot here. And as we go away from the fault tip, we have uh, co-seismic uplift and co-seismic substance. So you know here we're on the wrist, here we're on the finger. And the fascinating thing about this plot is it also plots um, the inner seismic uplift rates. So let's invert the co-seismic. So this, this red line that you might be able to see is just this yellow line inverted. And you'll see that it matches the inner seismic, now this is the, one of the inner seismic rates. So the inner seismic is the opposite of the co seismic, just like our finger and wrist model. So you guys really are experts. All right. and, um, and this also, then later in 1960, in 1964, in Chile, we had the largest magnitude 9.5, the largest earthquake ever recorded on modern seismological instruments. In 1964, we had the second largest earthquake ever recorded on seismometers. So this was a magnitude 7.5 and a magnitude 7.2. Um, and um, 
Uh, this was right when uh, plate tectonics was just about to be accepted by most people, all right? And so plate tectonics is a really young um, uh, science. And what this shows is, this is uh, surface displacement during the Alaska, from the Alaska earthquake, and this is surface displacement from the Chile earthquake. So you can, see, and here's the tip of the fault on both of those um, profiles. So you can see here we got the finger in the wrist part of the subduction zone, and George Platzer went out and documented that. So here's Alaska, the epicenter of the earthquake was here, and this red area here, outlined in red, is the area that went up, and this is the area that went down in 1964. And the same thing happened in Chile. Well, here's um, here's an air, aerial photo from right after the earthquake. Um, oh, let me quickly go back. So uh, the next photo that we're going to look at is from um, Portage, which is right here at the end of Turnagain Arm. And it's really funny. So Captain Cook is like going around all the fjords, turning left, turning right, and he gets to the, this arm of the of the Cook Inlet, and he goes, "Oh, we got turn again." So they call the turn again sound, turn again arm, right there. And so we're going to look at some geological evidence right along the turn again arm. And here, along the turn again arm, there's a, a river that comes in, and here's the highway. And uh, this whole area got flooded because it went down during the earthquake. And it's inundated by tidal water. And you can see some dead trees, some trees over there sticking up out of the salt water. How long do you think those are going to live in the salt water? Not very long. And then to the right, about a half a kilometer over here, is a world famous garage. And now you know about it, so it really is world famous. And this garage, there are pictures of this garage sitting in standing water. So the ground went down, and the people, the people who were mechanics were like, well, we're out of a job. And you can actually go there and see a truck that was embedded in the mud and it's still there. Well, Brian Matwater noticed. So here are some three air photos from this area. Here's the river and the bridge that, we, that we're looking at here. And this is before the earthquake. And you can see that there are shrubs and trees growing. So it's above high tide. And then this is a couple years after the earthquake. And now see, it's not dark in color, it's lighter in color. It's because it's filling in with bay mud, with estuarine mud. And then a few years later, less than 10 years after the earthquake, we start getting colonies of shrubs and trees again. So what Brian noticed is that after less than a decade, the area started going up again and filling in with sediment. So about 80% of the ground surface uh, had recovered in less than a decade. And then uh, I went up there uh, for a conference, and uh, here's some friends of mine, and uh, here's that garage, and they're standing in front of the truck, which is embedded in the mud. They can see people are walking, there are trees growing here again. So we've documented this over and over again, all along the Cascadia subduction zone also. And, and so, <clears throat> excuse me, so here's our little schematic. So here we have a tree that's growing in the soil, so it's above high tide, before the earthquake, then the land subsides during the earthquake, and now it's being inundated by tidal water, and the tree dies, it's that tree, and it still starts filling in with mud, tidal mud. So we get a, a soil buried in mud, and over time that mud fills in, and the risk goes up, and we start growing plants again. So here's a photo showing that you could see if you downloaded this, or if you went um, to look at this document, you can see there's this soil here, and here's all the mud, and now there are plants growing here again. So this is 1998. Well, these are these dots represent different locations where we've documented this type of earth, this type of evidence, sedimentary evidence for earthquakes. Well, here's some more evidence. Here's some tree stumps, and they got barnacles growing on them. Do barnacles grow on tree stumps? Yeah. Yeah. Well, here they do, but the trees are dead. So the trees are in, uh, being inundated by tidal water because the ground surface went down. So this is in the coast of Washington along Willapa Bay, and we call this a ghost forest. You can figure out where they came up with that name. So I um, uh, took a picture of the ghost forest in Alaska. So this is about five kilometers west of that garage, which is over there, over there behind Jim here. And uh, this is a tree 
that's rooted in this soil, and that soil was up higher before the earthquake, it subsided, and since then, since 1964, it's filled in with mud and gone up, and now we have plants and shrubs and trees starting to grow in there again. All right. So for Cascadia, uh, we've compiled, so if we go from the past to today, each of the, this little line, brown line should, represents the surface of the ground. So it goes up in between earthquakes, and then the, we have co-seismic substance. It goes up, we have substance, it goes up, substance. And here are these, each of these lines here is one of these co-seismically subsided surfaces. And if you want to learn more about this um, compilation, just uh, do a little internet search, type in the orphan tsunami in Atwater, and you'll find a PDF of his document that you can download for free, and there's lots of information in there that I'm not going to cover today. So we also have evidence of earthquakes, so that's on land, our land evidence. We also have evidence for these earthquakes offshore. And so I'm not going to go into a lot of the details, but I'm just going to briefly introduce you to this information. So here's our conceptual diagram. And so here's sea level. So we're all underwater. Here's the subduction zone fault. And when that subduction zone fault ruptures, it sends out seismic waves. And the seismic waves hit the seafloor, and they might trigger some submarine landslides. Well, those submarine landslides go down the slope. They turn into what we call turbidity currents. And those turbidity currents go down to the bottom of the slope, and they leave a deposit called a turbidite. And so we think these landslide deposits, these turbidites, are records of earthquakes. So here is a turbidity current in the lab in an aquarium um, showing what the turbidity current might look like and how it transports. Now we're looking down from above. And these turbidity currents can actually travel hundreds over a thousand kilometers in the deep sea. So they sort of self-propagate themselves. And if you want to learn more about the turbidity event history of the Cascadia subduction zone, do a little digital internet search and type in a professional paper 1661F. And this uh, I, I co-authored this document, and this goes into way more details that I'm going to um, present today. But um, and don't spend your time reading this. All right, you can download it later and, and check it out later. But these are all the different. Uh, um, ways that you could trigger a turbidity current, or a landslide that, that turns into a turbidity current. And we've figured out that some of these um, don't happen in the regions that we're studying, Cascadia, and some of them can happen, but they only happen over a, short, a small area. The only, thing, the only triggering of all these triggering mechanisms that operates over a large area is earthquakes, and of course, bolide impacts do. So those are uh, asteroids and meteors and stuff. But they have a really long recurrence interval, hundreds of thousands of years between every bolide impact in Cascadia. So we don't consider those based on frequency. So basically, the idea is if we can look for these turbidites over a large area and and correlate them from core to core, then we can um, then we're more certain we can say that an earthquake probably generated the landslide that turned into a turbidity current that left behind the turbidite. So here are some plots showing some cores. So depth is on the vertical axis. And um, we're just going to look at the, um, at the light blue plots. And so the light blue represents density with larger values to the left and smaller values to the right. And each of these yellow layers here, so the stuff on top of it, is a turbidite. So we've got a turbidite here, another turbidite here, another turbidite here. And basically, the shape of these curves shows you the, a density profile through the turbidite. And so if the earthquake triggered the turbidite, we think that the turbidite contains some of this information in the deposit. So we use the shape of these, this density profile to correlate these deposits from core to core. So you can see how this blue, this light blue plot here looks a lot like that light blue plot there. Not perfectly, but it looks a lot, a lot alike. Now, this is the same method that people use to correlate geological units when they're drilling for oil. So who drove a car today? All right, so you are driving a car because we can do this. Okay, 
So, so these are cores that are uh, hundreds of kilometers away from each other and have independent sources of sediment. So the fact that we are able to correlate these turbidites demonstrates that they were triggered by some triggering mechanism that operated over a large area. All right, so that's the basics. And so here we have all these white dots or all these uh, land sources of earthquake evidence. And then here are some uh, dots out in the ocean, which represent some of the cores. And here, this, uh, again, you don't need to worry about the details. This is just sort of like a schematic here. But we're going from north to south. And, and, and the vertical axis is time. And each of these little blob, blobs of black is an, uh, a range of ages that that earthquake that might have happened. And each of these little red or blue lines is how, uh, represents how we're correlating or linking the evidence okay. from place to place. And we can see is that some of these earthquakes happened over the entire subduction zone. And some of them happened over just part of the subduction zone. So Lucinda Leonard put this together. Um, with data from the professional paper before it was published, so don't do that. And then um, this shows um, the rupture area of the subduction zone fault for each of these um, different evidences. So you obviously can't read this, but there are you know 38 of these earthquakes over the last 10,000 years ruptured the entire subduction zone. About four of them ruptured this part of the subduction zone. Uh, less than 10 of them ruptured this part of the subduction zone, and less than 10 of them ruptured this part of the subduction zone. So you can see that the southern part of the subduction zone is rupturing more frequently than the northern part of the subduction zone. So I put this map together showing the average time in between earthquakes for each of these parts of the subduction zone. So in the northern part, it's about 515 years uh, in between earthquakes, and here north of here's, uh, present city, here's Cape Blanco, so for this segment, the average time in between earthquakes is 230 years. So, are we overdue? All right, well, I skipped uh, a whole bunch of statistics because I knew you would fall asleep, and I just have this one plot. Now, this shows, so this is a histogram showing frequency on the vertical axis and the average uh, time in between earthquakes on the horizontal axis. And so the, um, oh, this is, uh, so this is for, actually this is for the northernmost segment, okay? And so you can see that the time, the longer, the longest time in between earthquakes can be more than a thousand years in the northern segment. And I put a little red arrow showing where we are. So you can see that, you know, probabilistically, because no one can predict earthquakes, that it's going to be, it might be a while before we have another uh, earthquake in the northern part of the subduction zone. It's just an estimate, statistics. Here are the data from where we live, actually to the north of us. Um, it's even more frequent where we live. So this is up in Crescent City, between Crescent City and, and uh, uh, Cape Blanco. So here you can see the recurrence intervals are shorter. Um, and this is where we are. A little more than 300 years ago was the last subduction zone earthquake. So you can see that we're to the right of the uh, most of the mass of the histogram here. So um, people ask, you know, are we overdue for an earthquake? And you can't really know whether you are or not. That's sort of a qualitative answer. But you can show them this plot and have them make their own uh, decisions. All right. So let's take a 10 minute break and you guys can get more good beverages and then after that I'll talk about shaking intensity and tsunamis and then we'll take another break and we'll talk about tsunamis. Alright everyone, I'm going to turn on the mic and we're on the next three minutes. Okay, so I know you're excited about uh, drinking those beverages. Thanks so much. But we're going to get back to talking about uh, Cascadia. And I'm going to start talking about some of the effects that we would feel during an earthquake. And one of those effects is shaking intensity. So um, there was an earthquake last night in Vanuatu. 
which is in the southwest Pacific near Fiji. So, did you guys feel it? Yeah. I did not feel it. And why did not I? Why didn't I feel it? I'm too far away. That's right. So this is a plot showing on um, the horizontal axis we have um, distance from the earthquake. So on a log scale, 110, maybe about 60 or 70. Awesome, thank you. And on the vertical axis, we have, we have peak ground acceleration in the units of G. So 1G is the gravitational acceleration near the surface of the Earth, and a geophysicist will tell you that it varies quite a bit. But for a ground motion, someone who studies ground motions, we're going to define it at 9.81 meters per second squared, just to make it easy for us to use it as a unit. And uh, so what this shows you is that for earthquakes of magnitude 6, 7, 8, and 9, so 9 has more ground shaking than a 6 does, that it uh, attenuates or goes down with the distance. So just like you predicted, you didn't feel it. Okay. Now here's some real data. Now uh, that was uh, from this guy Zhao, uh, 2006, and so this red line is that same line plotted along some data from the to uh, Tohoku Oki 2011 earthquake. And you can see, so this is log scale, this is distance and linear scale. Here, this is 1G, 2G, 3G. So they recorded a whole bunch of locations that had more than 1G. So what that means is that the ground acceleration was more than that of the force of gravity. So if you're a boulder at those locations, you could be thrown into the air. And buildings, you don't want to be in a building that's being thrown into the air. So that's why we bolt houses to their foundations because we can actually get accelerations more than 1G. So I just want to show you some real data and how those data plot against the empirical relations that I plotted on the previous slide. Well, ground motions are also frequency dependent. So let's say I have a spoon, a big spoon of mashed potatoes, and I'm moving that mashed potato spoon, so I turn it on its side, and I move that spoon up and down like this. The mashed potatoes are not coming off that spoon. But as soon as I shake it like this, the mashed potatoes come right off. So you can say, well, you're accelerating it more. But it's really the frequency. And so what this shows is the ex uh, acceleration, amplitude of acceleration for different frequencies. Or here it says period, all right? Frequency, period, whatever. And so what this shows is that at some frequencies or some periods, there is larger ground motion than in other frequencies or periods. So it's frequency dependent. And it's also dependent upon where you are. So this is a cool plot. And it shows you a, um, a typical earth, a seismogram. All right. So with a typical, you know, let's say this is you know a no normalized amplitude. And we have little houses built on top of different materials. We have bedrock. We have sediment. Uh, lithified sediment, poorly consolidated sediment, and water-saturated sediment. And if you look at the amplitude of the seismic waves, you'll see that they get amplified in some places and not amplified in others. So if you're sitting, if you're living along Humble Bay, your house is probably going to shake more strongly than you're up on Fickle Hill somewhere, unless you're on a landslide. Uh, don't do that. So this is a model of what we think that using that first plot, the Zhao plot with the four different colors, using that empirical model and, and placing them in some amount of slip on that fault, this is how much ground shaking we would expect from a Cascadia subduction zone earthquake. Now there are dozens of models just like this, but this is the official USGS shake map for a magnitude 9 Cascadia subduction zone earthquake. Now the colors are the modified Mercalli intensity scale, the MMI. And that's a qualitative scale of how much the ground is shaking. So, uh, for example, and it ranges from 1 to 12. So 1 is not felt, except for very few under especially favorable co conditions. You know, 7 is very strong, damage is negligible to buildings with good design, slight to moderate and well-built ordinary structures. 12 is uh, damage is complete, you can't see straight, and cats and dogs are living together, right? So it gets, and so you can see that closer to the fault, 
is a warmer color, and further away from the fault is a cooler color. So just like we didn't feel the earthquake yesterday, over here you would feel it, but it, but um, your building wouldn't fall down like it might mine closer to the coast. So this is uh, those of you who read that New Yorker article on the Cascadia subduction zone earthquakes. Uh, the theme of, of uh, uh, Region 10, which is Idaho, Washington, Oregon, and, and Alaska, he said, "Oh well, we're, our plans are that west of the five is going to be toast." And uh, what he meant by that is. And we've done this locally. We, we use this analogy locally. Here's the five. So you're closer to the earthquake west of the five, and you're further away from the earthquake east of the five. That's all he meant. But people uh, interpret it incorrectly. So, um, so here's another view of the same shape map. And you can see in San Francisco, it's still going to shake. Sacramento, Reno, they're going to feel it in Reno. Although, they'll probably be fine because it's going to be an MMI 3 or maybe 4. And a couple years ago, um, I was uh, running a project and I had the California Geological Survey uh, create a shape map for an aftershock. So we think that maybe, remember those little faults that are in the North America plate? I had them uh, generate this aftershock um, shape map. So here's the little salmon fault. And you can see that the little, near the little salmon fall, it's going to shake as much as the subduction zone fall will. So this is certainly possible. And you can also see that it also diminishes with distance. So the reason why it's a smaller earthquake, this would be a magnitude 7, this would be a magnitude 9. The reason why it shakes as much as the magnitude 9 is because we're a lot closer to the fall. Because it comes all the way up to the ground surface. Remember, distance. It's all about distance. Um, it reminds me, some people asked about earthquake magnitude. So a uh, magnitude 7 and a magnitude 8, if you're talking about the energy released, the magnitude 8 releases 33 times as much energy as a magnitude 7, and a magnitude 9 releases 33 times as much energy as a magnitude 8. So 33 times 33 is how much more energy a magnitude 9 releases compared to a magnitude 7. So it just gives you a economy of scale. And uh, here's the maps that I put together using the same data. And so here, here's Humboldt Bay. And you can see the Humboldt Bay and uh, I'd say maybe 90% of uh, the inhabitants of Humboldt County lie within the MMI 9 region from the Cascadia. Now this is just a model. We don't know if this is what's going to happen. This is just an estimate, right? So it's good to, put, to have your buildings uh, built to withstand a magnitude 9, and that's what our building codes uh, require. So this all goes into building codes. And then this is the shape map uh, from the little salmon fall, and, uh, and you can see it only gets to magnitude 8, MMI 8. So, it is, so this is a magnitude 8, so you can see that it's almost as large as the Cascadia, but not quite. So I wasn't completely honest with you. And then, so again, magnitude 9, some well-built wooden structures are destroyed. Most masonry and frame structures are destroyed with their foundations and rail, so railroads, you know, the rails can be bent. So this is going to cause lots of damage. All right, so that's the ground shaking. Now let's talk a little bit about tsunamis. Toast. Oh, wait, no, that was the ground shaking. Okay, tsunamis. And you guys are all experts of tsunamis, but I'm just going to review this material for you. So here again is this brine out water. Remember, you could download it for free, the orphan tsunami. This is the diagram that he put together. So uh, before the earthquake, we have this happy marsh. Oh, look, isn't it happy? And it's above uh, the tide. And uh, during the earthquake, it goes down. And a tsunami comes in. It's filled with sand particles. Now, you could actually have a tsunami with no sand in it. So you wouldn't necessarily have geological evidence of it. But if there's sand in it, that sand is going to deposit and entomb those plants. And then, that, and then above that sand, we'll have tidal muds. And then the risk goes up. And uh, sediment comes in, and the ground surface gets high enough to grow these plants again. And these poor plants are dead. So here's an example along uh, the coast of Washington, Willow Bay. And uh, we'll look down here at the detail. And you can see here's the ground surface, the pre-earthquake ground surface, and here's a tuft of grass entombed in these tsunami deposits and later in the tidal mud that's on top. 
And you can see today there are plants growing in the ground surface again. So this, here's another map showing these dots where we have evidence of tsunamis. Well, guess what? This, these are some seven cores from Humboldt Bay I collected. And um, this is from uh, Hook and Slough, which is uh, right across the highway from CR. And here is the surface, the ground surface, uh, before the earthquake. And uh, you may or may not be able to see that there are large particles in here. These are uh, pebbles and granules, larger than you would expect in a tidal channel or a mud flat. So, um, and then above overlying those, or overlaying, I can never get that right, we have, um, uh, on top of, we have, we have the tidal mud. And so I've used uh, diatom uh, biostratigraphy to confirm that this was up high before the earthquake and this is down low after the earthquake. And then um, these sediments here have diatoms from the beach. So the only way they're going to you know, get in here, well, maybe not the only way, but we interpret this to be a tsunami deposit. So we actually have tsunami deposits in Humboldt Bay, but not everywhere. So each of these green dots represents a core that has evidence of co-seismic substance. So the risk is going down. And uh, these are uh, uh, cores here in red, are cores that have evidence of tsunamis. And these are some cores that uh, may have evidence of tsunamis, but we haven't tested that hypothesis yet. So remember, scientific method, you uh, make an observation, you come up with a hypothesis, you test that hypothesis, and then you reject or nullify or reformulate your, hy your um, hypothesis. So we haven't tested the hypothesis yet here in the Little River Valley. Um, now I, I am going to walk you through a couple slides. Now I'm going to be generalizing a lot on these slides. Now here's the paper that Rob Witter is the lead author of. Um, Oregon has done um, the most sophisticated tsunami modeling in the world for the coast of Oregon. And so everyone in the world reproduce what Oregon did in their subduction zone including California. So California had, just like Oregon, they had their deep version 1.0. Now Oregon did their version 2.0, and now California is going to be, is catching up. So in the next year or two, we'll have a tsunami inundation model, just like Oregon, right? So what they've done is, so here's, here's the subduction zone, and here are these different segments that we are familiar with, with different recurrence intervals. And, and also we know that they can be different sizes, and so the longer the earthquake's uh, length, the larger the earthquake can be, the larger magnitude. So what they've done is that, so here's a, a histogram showing the frequency and the time between earthquakes, and then these are um, their sizes. So they've, they've come up with a, a, a series of different scenarios of different sized earthquakes and how far, how long apart they are from. Now this is called a logic tree. And basically what they do, what, why we create these logic trees is to try to evaluate the hazard of all possible scenarios. So we want to consider everything. So we consider all the different sizes of an earthquake, all the different times between them, the rupture geometry, is it a deep earthquake, is it a shallow earthquake, is there a splay fault, like the little salmon fault or something like that and give it a name. And then after all that, then they, they assign a, a weight to the scenario. So these, uh, these authors think that um, a medium-sized earthquake with a recurrence interval of about 450 years with a splay fault, there's about a 32% chance that that's what's going to happen next. So then they take each of these scenarios, and uh, these are three scenarios here. So here's our subduction zone, and this is a cross-section. And so each of these scenarios, they come up with an estimate of how much that fault is going to split in which and where. So in the vertical axis here is the slip in meters along the fault, and then here's the geometry of the different faults. So we have a splay fault that comes up off of the subduction zone. Here in the green, we have a deeper fault, and here we have a shallower fault. And this is the amount of slip that they apply to each of those different models. So they, so in their model, they slip the fault, and that fault slip, depending on how much it slips, creates some deformation, some uplift. So these, the same three models, 
So this is showing how the C4, the finger part, is going to go up where the wrist part is going to go down. So this is the co-seismic deformation from their slip model. And then remember this, so this is the initial condition for that water that gets lifted up. So the shape of the seat of the water column looks like this. This is the shape of the water column. And then it either goes down and gravitationally goes down or, or up from there. And then they run each of those models. And so here, this is just clear. This is in Bandon. Here's Kate Longo. And so um, in color, so blue represents the largest earthquake. Red represents the smallest earthquake. So you can see the red earthquake makes a smaller tsunami. And the blue earthquake makes a larger tsunami. Well, then they apply those the weights in that um, model, you know, 32%. They apply those weights to each of these different models, and they get this type of a map. Now, this map is um, called a, a probability of exceedance. Now, that sounds like really big, but you guys are going to become experts on this, too. Basically, each of these colors tells you that there's a certain probability that the next tsunami is going to get that high. So, um, all, so the dark blue means that 100% of the, there's 100% probability that the next tsunami is going to get to the edge of the coast. And then here, this light blue, that means that there's a 10% chance that the next tsunami is going to be that big. So this can show you the whole range of possibilities, but you can know that there's a low likelihood that it's going to be this big, and there's a higher likelihood this could be this big. So this is the next generation map that we're going to be getting in the next year or two in California. This is a, a plot from north to south of Washington and Oregon. They always stop at the California border. I don't know why. And, um, and so these are the model. So this is the um, um, elevation of the run-up along the coast. So you can see there's lots of variation. So it's not really simple. You have to run these models. So in Humboldt Bay, in Humboldt, North, Humboldt County, Del Norte County, I started working uh, with Lori Denver and I came up with this map. Now this is the first tsunami hazard map for Northern California. And I produced this in 2003. And this incorporates distant tsunamis, so like tsunamis from Alaska or Chile. It incorporates, so that's one hazard, that's red. So these red areas might get inundated from a distant tsunami. It incorporates local tsunamis, so Cascadia subduction zone tsunamis are in orange. So this area might get inundated in Cascadia. And then, and then in, in yellow, it incorporates the worst case scenario, like at the high tide. So then the, a couple years later, the state of California came along and I started working with them. And this is their version 1.0, and you can download this. And this is their first estimate of inundation from a Cascadia subduction zone tsunami. So here's College of the Redwoods, here's Highway 101. And of course, I mentioned we'll be getting version 2.0. And then what we did was we took that map and we made these uh, evacuation maps. And you can download these from the Redwood Coast Tsunami Workgroup. This is the pamphlet for Humble for the entire area, but they have little pamphlets for these different communities. So here's sort of the time scale of these different maps, and then we're going to be getting version 2.0 state map, and then we'll probably make new evacuation maps for, for the Bay Area. Okay, let's take um, a five minute break, and uh, then we'll talk about sea level. If anyone wants to come and ask me more questions, and then I'll have a short talk about how the tectonics contribute to sea level locally. Okie dokie! That's the Johnny Carson impression. Person? Yeah, I remember. All you students probably don't remember Sonny Carson. Okay, so uh, we're going to have the, what was the, he dressed up as the wizard? Karnak. Karnak, yeah, we're going to have Karnak come out after uh, I talk about uh, sea level rise. Okay, so let's talk about sea level, um, because uh, here's the punchline. Now, don't laugh at this, but it's the punchline. I don't know why we call it that. Um, but we are experiencing, because of tectonics, we are experiencing the highest rate of sea level rise on the west coast of the continental United States, here in Humboldt Bay. So you can be proud of that. All right. So that's that's the punchline. But let's let's get there first. All right. 
or second. All right, so, so due, uh, due to glacial and interglacial cycles that have gone back millions of years um, and have left a, a really fantastic record for the last um, you know, uh, two, two and a half million years at least, um, so when, uh, when we have glaciers, a lot of the water goes up into the glaciers and the sea level goes down, and then when the temperature warms up, uh, the thermal content of the atmosphere increases, it melts the glaciers, and sea level rises. And also, due to thermal expansion of the water in the ocean, sea level rises. In fact, um, in the last couple decades, the thermal expansion of the sea of seawater accounts for about 40% of the sea level rise. So it's not just melting glaciers, but that's a big, big part of it. So here's a plot showing going back 140,000 years to uh, today, when this was published in 2001. Oh, April 27th, that's my birthday. It was published on my birthday. It's really cool. All right. So, um, and this is, so this is sea level. And uh, so 140,000 years ago um, was the last major glaciation before the last glaciation. So here we are today, and uh, um, um, the Honorable Blood Burke, professor of geology at uh, HSU, he always likes to talk about um, the oxygen isotope stages. And uh, he always said, oh, we're, I'm number one, I'm number one, or we're number one. So we're in oxygen isotope stage one at a high stand. So we're in between glaciers, glacial cycles. We're during an interglacial, so sea level's high. And then the last glacial maximum about 22,000 years ago, the, the uh, sea level was lower. And so once those glaciers melted, the sea level rose really rapidly. Well, if we go back 140,000 years, you can see that we've had a major glaciation, a major interglaciation, and then minor glacial and interglacial cycles until you get another major glaciation and major interglaciation. At some point, we'll have we'll start going back down slowly until we have another major glaciation. So this is one of the contributions of sea level rise, and this is the main reason before uh, 200 years ago the sea level was rising. And sea level rose really rapidly until about 6,000 years ago, and then tapered off to some, you know, one and a half million years a year. Um, but obviously, I don't know, obviously, but uh, Mike Furness gave a talk here a couple months ago talking about the anthropogenic contribution to sea level rise, but I'm not going to talk about that here. But that's um, important, um, especially with this plot. So the last slide is looking in the past, now we're looking into the future. These are some different scenarios. And uh, this is from the fifth uh, inter international panel on climate change assessment report summary for policymakers. If you down, if you go to the IPCC report, look at the SPM the summary for policymakers because it's really condensed and you don't need to read all the science. You can get to that if you want to, but start with SPM. And this is from the SPM. And I'd like to mention that a lot of these projections that you find in the in the, S in the IPCC reports are being exceeded. All right, so these are actually, a lot of the projections are underestimates. Um, and so this is a projection of sea level rise given several different scenarios. This RCP 8.5, this is a scenario that assumes that we will continue to emit um, greenhouse gases uh, at the same rate that we're going to. And you can see that there's an acceleration of sea level rise. So this is in meters. And then this is another scenario uh, assuming that we're going to start curving some of those. So people are using these different projections to try to model a sea level rise in the future. Um, if you're going to build a bridge or if you're going to restore an estuary, we're spending millions of dollars restoring estuaries. So we need, so we're taking this into account when we are designing those restored estuaries or the highways. Caltrans is considering this when they build bridges. So, but on top of this, we have our earthquake cycle. Right? Remember interseismic and co-seismic? Right now we're in the interseismic cycle. So what do you think is happening? Now I'm going to put the mic down. I'm going to drop the mic. Okay. So, okay. so here's sea level rise going up. So let's say now we're subsiding. Okay, we're on the risk. We're going down. What does that happen? What does that make sea level do? It goes up faster. Now let's say we're going up. And sea level's going up. It may, maybe sea level's not rising where we are. But if we're going up faster than sea level's rising, 
sea level would be lowering at that location. So in different parts of the coast, we find that we are might be on the finger and we might be on the wrist. Okay, so so if we're on the wrist, we're going up, and so sea level might be going down locally. If we're on the finger part, we're going down, and sea level is rising faster. So here are some early um, uh, papers that um, actually plotted their data wrong. I discovered this when I was looking into these papers because we wanted to study this. These are profiles of uplift rate from west to east. So this says from Arcadia to Reading. Both of these say from Arcadia to Reading. These are the same data, but somehow the numbers are different, and I couldn't figure that out. But this says this is Arcadia, and it says Arcadia is going up. I later realized that this is actually not Arcadia. This is Burnt Ranch, you know, which is on the other side of Willow Creek. So it's way out, way out of here. And so Burnt Ranch is going up, even though these papers say it's Arcadia. So Burnt Ranch, so I don't know how many miles. Was that 50, 60 miles east of here? Willow Creek's, oh, uh, highway miles. Willow Creek's 38 miles, so maybe 40 or 50 miles east of here or something like that. So Burnt Ranch, what part of the model is Burnt Ranch on? The, the wrist. Yeah, so Burnt Ranch is in the wrist part of the subduction zone. And these are incorrect. However, here's a, that same paper uh, from Kellen Wong. Uh, well, Hyatt and I hold Kellen in high esteem. He's much smarter than I am. So even though he made a mistake, that's okay. Um, and this plot shows an estimate using his model of how much uh, where and how much things are going to subside during the earthquake. So he thinks, based on this paper, they pose that Humble Bay is going to go down about two meters or more in, uh, during the earthquake. And here's an older um, paper by my colleague uh, Fluke, and uh, he thinks that Humble Bay is sort of is going to go down, but not as much as uh, Kellen Long did. But this is an older paper. So in warm, in warm colors, this is the risk. In cool to warm colors, that's the finger. So these are some existing models, but we knew that um, in, and, uh, in different versions of these papers, there are big question marks because they're not modeling the southern part of the subduction zone very well, and they recognize that. So um, my colleague Todd Williams and I uh, got over 30 of our uh, friends together from different local, state, federal um, agencies and several different universities. And we got together uh, to recognize what the problem was. And so we decided that we wanted to attack that problem. So we formed the Humble Bay Vertical Reference System Working Group, Humble Bay Vert for short. And this is our webpage, hbvcascadiageo.org. And we post all of our results on that website. And so what we did was we decided to use tide gauges, GPS observations, and benchmark level records to try to evaluate how the crust is deforming. All right. So, uh, so we applied for some uh, grant from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and so we have uh, cooperators from uh, Northern Hydrology and Engineering, Pacific Watershed Associates, Humboldt State University, and the University of Oregon, and our nonprofit Cascadia Geosciences to do this work. And we wanted to look at uh, your static sea level rise. Uh, level data, benchmark level data, GPS sites, and tide gauges to evaluate how the tectonics are happening here. So the reason why there was a problem is, so here's Crescent City. This is uh, 1933 when it started, so this time until today. This is meters, 0 0.15, 0 0.3, whatever, this is vertical. And so Crescent City is showing that the tide sea level is going down about half a centimeter a year. And at the North Spit, now this is where the Coast Guard station is. There's a tight gauge there. Uh, it was installed in the late 70s, 77. And it shows, even though there's lots of noise here, it shows a sea level rise at four and three quarter uh, centimeters, or a millimeters a year. Four and three quarter millimeters a year. So uh, the global sea level, U-stack sea level rise, um, depending on your estimates, ranges from um, uh, 2.3 2 to 3.5, depending on um, the day that you're using, millimeters a year. So we adopt 2.3 millimeters a year for our analysis. Um, so 2.3 is less than 4.7. So North Spit 
is going down. In fact, all the people that studied uh, tectonic deformation contribution to sea level rise start, stopped at Crescent City because they said this, this, uh, bent, this tide gauge is unstable. And then, you know, and then we contacted NOAA. They're like, oh no, it's very stable. It's very stable. Uh, but they did not want to uh, address the tectonics. So uh, that's why we got um, together. So here I've plotted um, uh, tide gauges all along from you know, Vancouver Island down to Northern California. And indeed, uh, the North Spit has the highest sea level rise along the coast here. So four and three quarter millimeters a year. And Crescent City is going down. All the, most of these other places is going up. So we installed some tide gauges. Um, there's some existing tide gauges, the North Spit tide gauge. Uh, the Army Corps had reoccupied some tide gauge locations in Samoa and Fields Landing. They were occupied in the 70s. And then Mad River Sloot, um, Jeff Anderson reoccupied sites there. We had money. We uh, set up a tide gauge here in Hookton Sloot. There's College of Redwoods, Highway 101. We set up a tide gauge there, collected some data. There's our tide gauge. And uh, again, here are the data, Crescent City. So Jeff Anderson did the analysis and still noticed that uh, Crescent City, the tide, uh, the sea level is going down, and North Spit, the sea level is going up. And so here are our results using sub subtracting uh, regional sea level rise. Uh, we find, you know, sea level in Crescent City is going down a millimeter a year, North Spit, Hook and Slough. 5.8 millimeters a year. That's the fastest sea level change in the West Coast. And then we subtracted uh, sea level to uh, determine um, vertical land motion, and uh, the hook and slew tide gauge is going down at 3.5 millimeters a year. So here's a plot showing the vertical land motion. So Crescent City, hook and slew, so you can see there's a gradient here in Hobo Bay is going down. And then we also looked at uh, benchmark uh, level surveys for different epochs. So here's 1989 to 16, here's the North Spit, here's Eureka. You can see that in the southwest part of this plot, uh, the ground is going down. Here in Arcata, the ground is going up. And here's a summary of the benchmark leveling data. And the uh, cool colors represent subsidence. And the warm colors represent uplifts, so you can imagine where the finger and the wrist are in those plots. And then I summarized those in these figures here. So here's Humble Bay, and we're zoomed in a little bit more. And so the red represents subsidence, and this incorporates the tide gauges and GPS sites. I didn't talk about GPS sites, but that's okay um, for time. And so you can see that this area here is experiencing uh, inner seismic subsidence. And then this area here, there's a little bit of noise in the data, is experiencing inner seismic uplift. And uh, have a little zoom in here to Southern Humboldt Bay. And so here's our tight gauge, three and a half millimeters a year. Here's a benchmark that's going down about four millimeters a year, right across from uh, Humboldt Bay. And we think the reason why, and uh, this is from Bob McPherson and from a poster I presented also, um, we think, now this, these blue lines are from Kellen Long, 2003, who I hold in high esteem. This was his lock zone, where the where there's the Velcro is keeping the finger there. This is the last slide, and um, and we and and so he so this is the finger part of the subduction zone. But our data suggests that the fault is locked east of there. So we think that the lock zone comes east. Words a little bit in this part of the world, um, and that's my punchline. Thank you very much.